was February of 1959. I was 27 years old at the time, so I wasn't just a kid. And um, I had been out of the Marine Corps for five years. And I was in terrible physical condition. I had lost what I, what I had gained through the United States Marine Corps by just working and being a family man and decided that I needed to do something in order to get back into some semblance of physical condition. Uh, never did like pumping iron, so uh, Jim was out of the question. I think we covered this in the, uh, in the article. But um, my brother-in-law came home and he said, did you know there's a judo school up on Tweedy Boulevard? I lived in Southgate at the time. And I said, no, but I'm going to check it out. Because I always had a, I just always had a, a love for, for that, for a martial art. And I had seen geese, but not close up. So I went down there one night, and uh, the place was closed. And this was like two nights after he told me. And so I, you know, I put my hands up to the windows, and I looked inside. And um, there was some funny-looking mats on the floor, and um, a couple of pictures on a wall and a desk and a chair. That was about it. And behind me was a couple of guys on a, uh, sitting on the fender of a car. And one says, uh, hey, you, uh, you interested in that? I said, well, I don't know. I said, uh, well, you know, what does it cost to take judo around here? And he says, well, we don't really teach judo. I said, oh, really? I look up on, his, up on the roof and I said, J-U-D-O. I said, uh, <clears throat> what's this? Well, no, I said, we're, we're not, we're not do that. Then there was another sign on the window and it says, Aikido. I said, what's this Aikido? He says, oh, that's Aikido. I said, oh, really? I said, well, what is it? He said, well, we don't teach that either. So now I'm thinking, you know, I, I just ran into a bad joke here. <laughs> I said, what do you teach? What's karate? He says, oh, that's karate. I said, excuse me? He says, that is karate. I said, would you? Did you say it one more time? Karate. So I finally, I got it. Ooh, karate. And I said, what is that? He said, well, I'll show you a couple of things. So we went back inside. He was like the, the caretaker. And, uh, and he showed me a few things with this other guy. And he showed me some strikes and some targets and some things. And I said to myself, whoa, I don't want to run into this dude, you know, when he's, when he's not feeling good. And, uh, and then the very next time, was like the classes were like uh, Monday, Wednesday. I couldn't make the Monday, so a week from then, a Wednesday, uh, a man walked in, big fella, and a uh, Hawaiian shirt, got into his gi, and when he moved, the walls moved. The floor shook. It was like a 3.2 aftershock of an earthquake. Every time a man moved, and he just he blew me away. And then that, of course, was Edmund K. Parker. And uh, I am so, I feel so blessed to have been in the first group that he brought up to and through Black Belt because this was the formative time of the art. And uh, which, it, it took me a long time to get past the word karate because the first time I heard somebody say karate, I thought, <laughs> you don't even know what you're talking about. <laughs> how could you be studying, you know, my art when you don't even know, what you, how do you even know how to say it? And then after a while, everybody said karate, and, and we sounded weird. So it became like, uh, what are you trying to be, you know, trying to be affectatious or something? Karate, what are you, are you clowning around? <laughs> and, all right, when I first learned the five count, which, as I said earlier, had no name, it was just nicknamed the five count, they didn't include the, the block. The block would be an inward to a chop on the side of the, side of the neck, carotid artery. All right, this would be one. The next one was a heel palm face two three we learned it initially with the fingers well it didn't last too long because people kept messing their fingers up so they went to a half fist which makes much more sense now this the chop goes to the other side of the neck this was supposed to bend the guy over well unfortunately when i get hit this way i don't go that way i don't you you you, you bend at the at the at the waist actually not at the waist at the hips the hip joint is where you actually this is where you bend over uh, about the only thing that's going to bend me over is a kick to the groin, and that, that gets you every time. Well, I always had a thirst for martial arts. Um, it was It's kind of ironic because I used to watch TV a lot. And I saw this one master, and it just happened to be Ed Parker. And it was very ironic when I finally got to the school and found out that he was the grand master. Um, it, I was really pleased that it was his style that I was studying. 
It was about 1964. I really, really wanted to study martial arts. I would study anything I could find, a little wrist lock, or some kid at school would have something, and he would show me, and we'd make up a little skit, and we'd do a demonstration. We'd have a counter for it, and we'd have fun. Um, I walked into Chuck Sullivan and Ed Parker School in Inglewood. It was the original Inglewood Ed Parker Chuck Sullivan School, and it was late 1963, early 64. And I started uh, studying Kempo with Chuck Sullivan and Ed Parker at the Inglewood Ed Parker School. Well, there was a guy there called Crazy George, and he was the basics instructor. And Mr. Sullivan didn't get off work till about 6.30 or 7 and get there. And Crazy George, or George Quinones is his, is his name, was the basics instructor. At that first class, I thought we were going to die. Um, he would taught us how to block, and he said, now have you got it? I had no idea that he was going to punch us in the nose and could stop this close to our nose. We had to block to get out of the class. We did, we did lots, lots of fighting and lots of techniques. Um, forms were like, not secondary, but um, we didn't do them every night. We were more interested in reality training. Um, Danny Inasano had just gotten his black belt from Chuck Sullivan and left to go with Chuck Sullivan and Ed Parker at the school and left to go with Bruce. Well, it just so happens that uh, Danny Inasano had a flat top and Chuck Sullivan had the barber shop. Everybody went to Chuck's barber shop for a haircut. So Danny came back every two weeks to get a haircut at Mr. Sullivan's barber shop and told us exactly what Bruce was doing. And then Chuck would tell Danny what we were doing and he'd go back and tell Bruce and we went back and forth. So it was kind of exciting. Well, I, I love my Kempo and I was a well, well-rounded fighter and I really liked it. I was just in thirst of something else. And back in the day, you didn't go out and study another style and expect to come back, okay? But Chuck Sullivan was open-minded. Danny Nassano was a personal friend of his. I ran into Richard Bastilio at a Harley shop. I had a Harley shop myself. I built custom choppers. Richard had a Jeet Kune Do shirt on and said, uh, I said, I know Jeet Kune Do. And I showed him a hook tear punch and he laughed at me. And, um, I said, I'll build your Harley if you teach me Jeet Kune Do, and that's how we got started. I went over to Danny Inasano School. It was the IBM Academy in Torrance, California when it first opened. And uh, I built Richard a Harley, and uh, he started to teach me. And I studied privately with Danny, and I studied group classes with Danny. And then Jerry Potique, um, he just happens to be French, and I'm French. Um, he liked me, and he took me aside. And I spent about 10 to 15 years studying privately with Jerry my Jeet Kune Do training. I, I really enjoyed the Jeet Kune Do training. I've studied a lot of different styles, but it really helped me understand a lot of things that I already knew. What I've taken from my Jeet Kune Do training is Jeet Kune Do or JKD, they would consider classical karate people front classical committed blockers. The sensitivity and the dissolving of the front hand is very important. I like to give that to my people. As I throw a right punch, he blocks. I like to dissolve and roll around it. Mr. Parker would do a thing called reroute. He would come in and, and move around and hit. It was very, very similar. There's a lot of similarities in the art. But the sensitivity and the dissolving and the energy in this, again, that rolling around and feeling it, and just feeling it works so nice to be able to get around once you've thrown something and you run into an obstruction or a block. Okay? We have a drill that I take. It's called Bung Sao Drill. It's just a block, trap hit, block, trap hit. This is a two-man cooperative drill. It's actual JKD drill. Switch. So. One of the other styles we were introduced to was taught to us by Chuck Sullivan. Chuck Sullivan, in the very beginning, Ed Parker had James Wing Wu with him, and he taught a longhand Chinese Kung Fu style, which strikes with the four knuckles and the back knuckles which is a little different if you've never seen it. And anything we can do to win a fight works with the old long hand with the blocks, the old The long hand Chinese works real well, especially if you've never seen it before or have never had it used on you. It's a little different than a straight. We also studied a little bit of the Japanese art, the, the bonsai run, which is the poem exploding knee shuffle punch kick. If you can't do an opposite kick punch, which is you have to practice it, it's not easily learned, it's okay, it's real hard to stop. So from here, boom, boom, boom.